Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC. It's also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. This program is later archived on speaker.com. So hi there, my name is Rabbi Pearl, all alive and well. I'm telling you, I'm kicking all over. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends when you're listening. So dear friends, oh my goodness, today, today is the last day of the holiday of Sukkot. So come Sukkot, the Jewish people the world over will become expert in botany. Suddenly, we gain impeccable tastes in the growth, the health, the beauty of a citron fruit, a palm branch, a myrtle, and a willow. In Hebrew, it is called the, the etrog, the lulav, the hadassim, and the haravas. Now these are four species which Jewish people around the world have spent exorbitant amounts of money to buy what they perceive to be the best and the most perfect of these four species. And each day, we made a blessing. We held unto these four types for the seven days of Sukkot. We shook them each day, and we treat them like little princes. And of course, it comes straight out to the Chumash, where the Torah tells us you should take for yourself on the first day a splendid tree fruit, date palm fronds, a branch of a braided tree, and willows of the brook. But why these four, my friends? Why these four? Do you know how many plants there are in the world? The total number of plant species in the world is estimated at 390,900 by the Royal Botanic Gardens. Approximately 1,000, 2,000 species of plants are edible by humans. About 100, 200 species of plants play on an important role in world commerce. And about 15 species provide the majority of food crops. These include soybeans, peanuts, rice, wheat, bananas. There are, I'm giving you some absolutely worthless information. But there are estimated to be about 7,500 types of just apples, 1,600 types of bananas alone. To put that into perspective, if you ate a new type of apple every day, it would take little over 20 years to try them all out. For the bananas, it would take a little over four years. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's such important information you woke up to listen to. So the obvious question is, why does the Torah choose from among these 300, 390,000 plants to take these four species on suckers? Again, the citrus fruit, the palm branch, the myrtle, the willow, they're not even edible fruits and plants. Gewalt geschrigen. So over the millennium, scores of insights have been offered. Two of them, amongst others, are quoted in the Medrash, and they both seem strange. Medrash number one explains that these four species represent our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And it explains that the beautiful fruit represents, the etrog, is represented by Abraham, beautified by old age. Torah tells us Abraham was, grew old. He came in his days. The palm branch combines a lot of leaves and binding them together. This reminds us of Isaac, who is bound on the altar. Jacob had many children, just as the myrtle branch is full of leaves. And Joseph died before his brothers, just as the willow with us before the other three plants. So this begs for an explanation. The connection between these four types of plants and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph appear to be like a stretch. Also, why do we want to remind ourselves on Sukkot of these particular four people? Furthermore, must we use plants to recall them? Come on already. Well, a few lines later in the same Medrash, it gives us another insight to these very four kinds. And the four plants reflect four major parts of the human body. The citrus fruit, the atrog, looks like the heart. The lulav, the palm branch, mirrors the human spine. The hadas leaf is shaped like an eye. And the willow leaf is shaped like a mouth. This is charming. But, I mean, maybe too much to ask. Why do we need to recall these four parts of our body? 
enough already. So I'd like to suggest that these two explanations are really interrelated. On Sukkot, we were invited to take to ourselves Lakat and Lachem. We're, we're asked during this past week to take our heart, our spine, our eye, and our mouth. But of whom? Whose heart? Whose spine? Whose eye? Whose mouth? Guess what? It, of course, is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. On this holiday, we are charged with a mission to embrace the etrog, the heart of Abraham, the lulav, the spine of Isaac, the hadas, the eyes of Jacob, and the arava, the mouth of Joseph. Let me explain how this works. The heart of Abraham represents the legendary timelessness of the Yiddish hearts. A Jew walks into a shul in New York in 1949. No one knows him. No one owes him anything. A complete stranger. But people look over to him and say, Shalom Aleichem, where are you coming from? Do you have where to stay? Do you have where to eat? Which city are you from? Did we ever meet perhaps any of my family in the DP camps? Guess what? This Today, in a walk into a shul in 2019, the questions may be different, but the heart, the heart of Abraham, the heart filled with sensitivity, love to mankind, is the same. So that same heart, the heart of a man who has a, a tent with four doors, Abraham, on all sides, to welcome guests from all directions, still beats in the, in the organisms 3,600 years later. So kindness belongs to Abraham. This was the Hadar, the beautiful fruit, the beauty and the splendor that he was blessed with. This is the embodiment of our hearts, the Etrog, the heart of Abraham, the heart that feels the pain, the needs, the plight, and the soul of another human being. Hello, are you listening? Now let's move on. The spine. The Lula represents the spine, our spine. This is the spine and the sense of confidence and pride represented by Isaac, who, with an upright posture, walked to the altar and allowed himself, like the fronds of the palm, to be bound. And Abraham tells him that God chose him as an offering. And the Torah says, they walk together. Isaac continues to walk upright. He does not duck, bend, or run. Isaac bequests that spine, the lulav, to us, the ability for us to make sacrifices for what is true for God, for Yiddishkeit, with vigor, with pride, with dignity and unwavering resolve. We do not apologize for being who we are and become defensive, meek, bent or repressed. We carry our Yiddishkeit with full confidence and with dignity. We stand erect. We are capable of standing up for our people and our faith with pride and full stature. So we've covered Abraham's heart and Isaac's spine. Then there is the eye of Jacob. Why? Because he has an eye for the future. Eye, purpose of eyes, is to be able to look, look now and look forward. Jacob professes long-term vision. He is the first to have a dream. In the middle of the, of the dark night, he dreams of a ladder standing on earth and its peak etched into the heavens. So he sees that now he may be comfortable. But if he wants to guarantee the future, there's no way he can educate his children when they are in an environment and under the spell of Laban, the crook, the idolater, the liar and the thief. Jacob must leave, return to his old country and raise the children near their old grandpa, Isaac. This is what the Medish in intimates when it says that just as the Hadas has many leaves, Jacob had many children. N Jacob never considers only for a moment, uh, for, uh, only the moment. He has an eye, an eye for the future, a dream for where things are going. He focuses on his children and on their children all the way down to our times. Jacob understands that we must not allow our eyes to become blinded by the bliss and the ignorance of the present. Is this the Jewish eye, the myrtle leaf, which Jacob beque bequests to us? We can ask ourselves, do we have an eye for our own future? Do we sacrifice our destiny for, the, for present comfort? Do we see the consequences long-term of how we are educating our children today? Sometimes we wake up late because we fail to use our eyes, our vision. We got 
caught up in the moment and fail to make hard decisions that will transform our future into a blessing. Some people get divorced in haste, ignoring their future. Some people make short-term decisions about the schooling and education of their children, not realizing that when these kids grow up, they, may, they might be lacking the heart, the spine, and the eyes that we didn't give them out of shortness, our own short-sightedness. And finally, on Sukkot, we celebrate the mouth of Joseph. He is the man who gave us the Jewish mouth. What do I mean? As jo- uh, Joseph reveals to his brothers after 22 years, right, he reveals himself. He says, I'm Joseph. They can't believe it. They are astounded, frightened, overwhelmed. Joseph calms them with these words. You see, it is my mouth that speaks to you. What does it mean? Joseph, of course, was not referring only to the technical language, to the words, the syntax, the grammar, and the diction. He was referring to the common language that they shared, what we might call in Yiddish, the Yiddish Sprach, a Jewish shared language. Words that express our value systems, our priorities, our longings, our belief system. As Joseph shared that common language with them, they knew that he must be their long-lost brother. Joseph knew the language of the Jewish family. They saw that he had a keen awareness of the soul, the terms, the concept, the quips, the euphemisms, the cultural associations, and the passions that no one but their brother could have known. There is a certain family language, let's say, that a family shares. And there is certainly a shared language that we all have shared over 4,000 years. So Joseph bequests to us that Jewish mouth. Even in Egypt, he never lost that language. Even in the depraved Egypt, Joseph never lost the language, his language. As we say, the sages tell us, Shem Shemaim Shogu Bapiv. The name of God was always constantly on his lips, as a slave, as a prisoner, and as a prime minister. Which is why, to further prove he is alive, he sends a message to his father, reminding him of the last conversation in Torah learning before Joseph left 22 years earlier. It was that conversation that bonded them across decades and countries. It is that language that still binds us to each other to this very day. So no matter if you're a banker, a lawyer, a doctor, CPA, a broker, a shmegegi, a barber, we have a certain sprach, a language. Our mouth is shaped to produce words, concepts, sensitivities ingrained in us from the days of Joseph. So during this past week, during the week of Sukkot, we are told, take for yourself, lekachtem lechem, Take for yourself the Etrog, the Lulav, the Adas, the Arava. Embrace the Jewish heart of Abraham, the spine of Isaac, the Jewish eyes of Jacob, and the Jewish mouth of Joseph. Then you will rejoice before your God for seven days. To experience unbridled joy, we must embrace these four dimensions of our lives. Because with these four organs in place, we are good to go. We can remain secure, powerful, wholesome, cohesive, and eternal. So today, as we come to the conclusion of the holiday of Sukkot, we must ask ourselves, do I possess the heart of Abraham? Do I really have the spine of an Isaac? Do I have the eyes and the vision of a Jacob? And do I have the mouth of Joseph? I want to share with you a story that talks about the Yiddish Sprach, the language of Yiddish, in the most strangest of places. Unlike today's vista of decrepit buildings, dilapidated housing, and rusting junk cars, the South Bronx in 1950 was the home of a very large and thriving community, one that was predominantly Jewish. Today, a mere remnant of that once vibrant community survives. But in the 1950s, the Bronx offered synagogues, mikvahs, kosher bakeries, kosher butchers, all the comforts of one would expect from a traditional Jewish community. The baby boom of the post-war years happily resulted in many new young parents. As a matter of course, the South Bronx had its own baby equipment store. It was called Sixers. It was located in the corner of Westchester and Fox and specialized in everything for the baby as its uh, slogan uh, ran. The inventory began with cribs, baby carriages, playpens, high chairs, changing tables, and toys. 
Well, Mr. Sixter, assisted by son-in-law Lou Kirshner, ran a profitable business out of the needs of the rapidly expanding child population. The language of the store was primarily Yiddish, but Sixers was a place where not only Jewish families, but also many non-Jewish ones could acquire the necessary paraphernalia for their newly arrived bundles of joy. Business was particularly busy one spring day, so much so that Mr. Sixer and his son-in-law could not handle the unexpected throngs of customers. Desperate for help, Mr. Sixer ran out of the straw, stopped the first y- young man that he spotted on the street, and he says, Young man, how would you like to make l- some little extra money? I need some help in the store. You want to work a little? The tall, lanky African-American boy flashed a toothy smile back. Yes, sir, I'd like some work. Well, then, let's get started. The boy followed his new employer into the store. Mr. Sixer was immediately impressed with the boy's good manners and demeanor. As the days went by, and he came again and again to lend his help, Mr. Sixer became increasingly impressed with the youth's diligence, punctuality, and readiness to learn. Eventually, Mr. Sixer made him a regular employee at the store. It was gratifying to find an employee with an almost soldier-like willingness to perform even the most menial of tasks and to perform them well. Well, from the age of 13 until his sophomore year in college, the young man by the name of Colin put in from 12 to 15 hours a week up to at 50 at 75 cents an hour. Mostly he performed general labor, assembling merchandise, unloading trucks, preparing items for shipment, he seemed in, in a quiet way to appreciate not only the steady employment, but the f- friendly atmosphere Mr. Sixer store offered. Mr. Sixer learned in time about their helper's Jamaican origins, and he in turn picked up a good deal of Yiddish. In time, young Colin was able to converse fairly well with his employers, and more importantly, with a number of Jewish customers whose English was not fluent. After serving two tours of duty in Vietnam, the young man quickly rose to the top ranks of the U.S. military. In 1989, under President George Bush, this young man, Colin Powell, was sworn in as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and later became U.S. Secretary of State. In 1993, two years after he guided the American victory over Iraq in the Gulf War, Colin Powell visited the Holy Land, Upon meeting Israel's Prime Minister then, Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir in Jerusalem, as you know, Shamir was born in Belarus, to a family that spoke mainly Yiddish. So in 1993, and the Prime Minister of Israel meets this impressive African-American general. They sit down to have a talk. Colin Powell turns to Shamir and says, Mikendach read in Yiddish? Do you mind if we speak in Yiddish? Shamir almost fell off his chair. He is stunned as he tried to pull himself together. Colin Powell continued chatting in his second favorite language. He had never forgotten his early days in the Bronx. Isn't that a fascinating? How beautiful, how uplifting. And so, if you know any Yiddish, sehr good, sehr schön. Forget nicht the Yiddish. But my dear friends, those special traditions that we all know. So here we are on Hashan Araba. This day, on this evening, we'll be celebrating the last two days of the holiday, the long stretch of holidays from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur to the beginning of Sukkot to Chalamoy, the intermediate days. Today's Hashan Araba, and then tomorrow is Shmini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. Amazing. Our sages tell us that, you know, the, the year, the Jewish year, begins with two days of holiday, two days of Rosh Hashanah, and concludes with two days of Shmini Atzeres, where we include Yiska and, of course, Simchas Torah. And the Rebbe's, the Lochabad Rebbe's, would always say and teach us that what we can accomplish on the first 48 hours in, in ways of, of, of uh, solemnness and seriousness can be made up and can be elevated and can be, uh, you know, accomplished through the last 48 of 
the tremendous joy associated with the last two days of Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. And we invite everyone to join us tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. at Chabad Miniolo for Simchas Torah, dancing. Help us on Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. to help us make a minion on Simchas Torah. But the key is joy and Simcha. Interesting, how do we express this joy? Mainly by dancing with the Torahs. The Torahs are taken out of the ark and we proceed to dance with them as they're wrapped up. Why would that be? Would, you would think that the great joy would be expressed through studying and speeches. In fact, it's a great day on, on Simcha's Torah. The rabbi doesn't make a speech. That's why the shul is filled, is packed. Why would this be? Why would it be a joy of just simply dancing with the Torah? Why not sit and have a, a lecture and learn, study? Well, what's unique about the joy of Simcha's Torah is that we take the Torah wrapped up and we become the feet. The Torah cannot move without our help. So on Simcha's Torah, we take the Torah and we kind of, so to speak, make ourselves the feet. We carry it around, around the synagogue. We dance with it, recognizing that even as it's important to learning and studying, there has to be one day when we set our minds aside and focus on just the excitement and the wherewithal that the, the feet represent, that commitment to Hashem, just like the, the, the feet follow, follow instructions, so too we have the ability to follow the wonderful teachings of what Torah has to say to us. And that's why it's so important for us to be reflective on these joyous moments as we go in from Sunday to Monday and Tuesday, these last two days of this great holiday of Sukkos. You know, what, what is Shemini Atzeris all about? Shemini Atzeris, which, as I mentioned, includes the Yiska services. It also represents, you know, we've been together with so many holidays and so many joyous occasions. In our synagogue at our Chabad Center, we had an amazing Simchas Beis HaSheva, amazing Sukkos party and barbecue sponsored by Mark and Karen Scherer. It was an amazing... So many people showed up. We were dancing. In fact, one of the guests who came, who joined us for the second time now, because the first time was in Rosh Hashanah, was none other than Mark Glickman. He was a the leading bass um, on the famous Twisted Sister um, heavy metal band in the 80s. Now, don't ask me too many questions about that, because that's not what I learned in the yeshiva. But he's a fantastic guy, Mark Glickman. He came to shul. His, his Yiddish guide, his soul, has, is, is alive and well. And one day he's going to play for us a few, a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of nagunim over there, a couple of songs. And uh, we look forward to that. But the, the important thing is to, what, what is this sukkah all about? You know, there's so many ways you express your caring for somebody. Um, you like the way they speak. So you speak to them nice words. You gaze on someone you like. You may even kiss someone, you know, that you like. So you can speak, you can gaze, you can kiss. These are all ways of how we express our friendship and our love. But there is a deeper way of doing that. And that is with a hug. What's the difference? When you smile at someone or say something nice, or gaze at someone, you, you may be doing it because of some personal, personal, um, you know, reciprocation. You like that person. You like what he stands for. They look nice, they speak nice. But a hug actually completes, not the, the hug covers the back as well, not just the face. But the way a hug your hand goes around and covers the back as well, right? A hug is a hug. I share this with you because what is the sukkah that we've all experienced? And we really had some experience this week with the sukkah, with all that wind and rain. Many of the sukkahs that I know lost their, uh, lost their tops, their sukkah, the schach, and had to be put together very quickly. But what is, what is this, the, the sukkah? The sukkah is really God's way of hugging us. You go into the sukkah, you feel the warmth, 
They feel the camaraderie. Doesn't matter who the person is. Everybody's worthy of sitting in the sukkah. And it's really a hug from the Almighty God saying to us, yes, there's times, you know, with, with more of a face-to-face kind of encounter we have with the Almighty God, you know, a very reciprocal one. But God says to us, don't worry. In the course of the year, wherever you may be going, I got your back, so to speak. I'm hugging you. I'm with you. I'm, surpri- I'm, I'm, I'm supporting you. I'm giving you all the blessings that you need to be able to make it, make it through the year. And we also explain that during this week of the seven days of Sukkot, we have Ushpizen, which is an a, um, Aramaic word from the Zohar that speaks of special guests that come. We're told that from Gan Eden, from the Garden of Eden, they leave our seven shepherds, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Joseph, and David, King David. They all leave their abodes and they come to visit each of our sukkahs. They're there every night. Each night, though, is led by another individual. So the first night is led by Abraham, and etc., Isaac, etc., Jacob, etc., Interesting, we don't mention King Solomon. We uh, just mention everyone through David. Why would that be? Well, the answer is that the sukkah lent itself to what these special shepherds represent. They, their lives were not easy. They all had experiences of exile. Abraham had to leave his hometown. Isaac had to completely run out, away from si- different situations. Jacob, for sure, left the Canaan and go to Egypt. And of course, Moshe and Aaron were out of place, constantly going through the wilderness. And Joseph was sold by his brothers and found himself in Egypt as well. And of course, King David was on the run from King Saul so many, so many times. The idea, of course, is that they understand what exile is all about. And they come to our shaky kind of sukkah, where we feel an exile. And they come to say, don't worry, we know what you're going through. We went through it ourselves. And we're praying and we'll be watching over you and making sure that you're successful as you proceed into the new year. And that is why we are visited by these special Ushpizen, these special guests. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing everybody a good kvittal. All the best to you and to your family. Please join us. Please join celebrations of Simchas Torah. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing you all the best. A good year and a good yontif.